The world our ancestors walked into was pure nightmare fuel. Giant beasts ruled the land, brutal weather wiped out the weak, and danger was everywhere. Homo sapiens were small, fragile, and had almost no chance. But somehow, they didn't just survive. They changed the game forever. How did the weakest hunters end up ruling a world built to destroy them? The answer is more incredible than you think. Okay, it doesn't take a genius to know the Earth around 50,000 years ago was not the world we know today. Forget the skyscrapers, the robots, and the automobiles that roam the streets. On a fundamental level, the Earth was a whole different experience during those times. For one, it was colder, drier, and to be frank, a whole lot weirder. Think about it this way. This was a time when glaciers the size of continents covered vast portions of the northern hemisphere, and sea levels were so low you could walk from Siberia to Alaska without getting your feet wet. Today, this may sound strange, but this was the late Pleistocene period, a time period defined by climatic chaos and ecological insanity that would leave even the sanest of minds boggled. Today, it's common to worry about climate change, but back then, ancient humans probably prayed for climate change. But why? Well, unlike today, this time period had no stable, cozy climate. No, the Earth was like a pendulum on a roller coaster, swung between glacial and interglacial phases, with a kind of climatic mood swing only a geologist could love. In fact, these fluctuations were so insane that they drove radical shifts in ecosystems, water availability, and even vegetation zones. To put it simply, this was a world where a single generation could witness expanding tundra, shrinking forests, and the appearance of new migratory corridors all at once, the equivalent of experiencing your home become a desert, then a swamp, then a snow-covered tundra, and then a desert all in 75 to 100 years. This nightmare of a time was when our ancestors, the Homo sapiens, lived. Anatomically modern and cognitively advanced, these ancient humans stepped onto a planet still dominated by what we can only call megafauna. Yes, in a time when the literal environment was out to get you, their major problem was not the rain or snow. It wasn't even the heat. No, it was the fact that they lived in the age of giants. This was a time period when mammoths roamed the mammoth steppe, where woolly rhinoceroses, giant elk, and herds of bison moved like living storms across the landscape where being human would have made you prey to so many, and collateral damage to many more. And it wasn't just Eurasia, it was the whole world. North America was populated with giants like the Mastodons, ground sloths, saber-tooths, and bears like Arctodus simus, which, by the way, is a hypercarnivore that stood over 11 feet tall on its hind legs. Over in South America, Glyptodonts and giant armadillos were tundling across savannas that would eventually vanish. Africa, although milder, also had its own beasts like elephants, lions, hippos, and so much more. And while you might think Africa was relatively safer, what it lacked in giants, it made up for in the pressure of a changing climate that was beginning to reshape habitats. In every way, it seemed like the world was going insane. But here's the crazy part, that's just the prologue. Because here's the real question, how did Homo sapiens thrive in a world already ruled by titans? What did we do that the Neanderthals, Denisovans, countless other hominins, and even mammoths couldn't? Well, to find out, stay tuned, because the Ice Age world was just the stage. The real story is how we took over the play. Today, it seems that, as humans, there is almost nothing we can't achieve. However, strip away our technology, and the humble Homo sapien becomes what we would refer to as a fragile predator. See, against all odds, in the age of giants, despite the difference in power and size, these ancient humans still managed to dominate the planet. Now, today this might seem like the expected outcome, but back then, this made no sense. Especially when you consider we managed to survive where our physically stronger cousins, the Neanderthals, and many other smaller megafauna couldn't. This paradoxical rise to dominance, despite being an insane outcome, can be attributed to a combination of anatomical features, cognitive abilities, social structures, and technological innovations, the likes of which the world has never seen before. In order to understand what was happening in the early Homo sapiens brain, we have to first view it through something called the social brain hypothesis. See, the social brain hypothesis states that our larger brains developed in response to managing new and complex social relationships. The hypothesis is supported by Dunbar's number, which claims that humans can only maintain stable relationships with approximately 150 people. This number likely helped Homo sapiens manage and maintain larger and more cohesive social networks, as compared to Neanderthals, who lived in bands of approximately 10 to 30. As you would expect, these larger social networks would have helped foster cooperative foraging, which was by every standard a critical survival strategy. 
To take things a step further, evidence of shared hunting practices among hunter-gatherer societies tells us that Homo sapiens hunted in larger, more coordinated groups. Much like gangs today, this grouping possibly gave them an edge over Neanderthals and other animals, who may not have had the same level of social coordination, but going out as a group was just one part of the equation, as what truly made all the difference is what still makes all the difference today technology. See, much like with all of history, tool development was a key factor in the Homo sapiens' unlikely success. See, when we look at our cousins, the Mousterian tools associated with them were primarily flake-based and used the Louvois technique. This technique basically involved preparing a core by striking off flakes in a controlled manner, producing tools with a predetermined shape. So basically, smack it until it's sharp and pointy. Although it seems simple, this technique allowed for the creation of sharper, more efficient tools with less waste, such as scrapers, points, and, of course, blades. When Homo sapiens came onto the scene, much like most things, they took a different path. What they came up with was the origination tool industry, which was more advanced, with blade tools, bone, and antler implements. Now, to us today, this too was relatively simple, but in actuality, it reflected a greater technological sophistication that would define the species. And as you can already deduce, this leap in tool-making ability is a direct result of cognitive milestones that allow for improved planning and resource utilization. More than any other thing, cognitive evolution played a central role in the rise of Homo sapiens. From the formation of tools to get this language, although it isn't what you might imagine when you think of early Homo sapiens, evidence from the Blombos cave, including ochre engravings and shell beads dating back as far as 77,000 years, suggests that early sapiens actually engaged in symbolic thought, and possibly early forms of language. This insane cognitive leap made all the difference, as it allowed for more complex social structures and better communication, which even today is essential for organizing large-scale hunting and survival strategies. Not to mention the development of theory of mind, which is the ability to understand others' mental states, also played a large role in helping cooperative behaviors and strategic thinking. Now, all this is amazing and borderline mind-blowing, but what truly set our species on the path was the ability to control nature, and it began with Prometheus's gift, fire. To understand what I mean, we have to look at the Wrangham hypothesis, which states that the control of fire and the invention of cooking were extremely important in human evolution, but not in the way you think. According to the hypothesis, cooking food produces more digestible contents that are higher in nutrients, which gives a greater caloric load while requiring less energy to digest. In essence, the argument is that the energy savings allowed our ancestors to divert more energy into developing their brains, which made us, as we've already seen, the ultimate fragile predator. So with all that said, what happened when our ancestors faced the giants of the time? To understand what happened when our ancestors met with the giants of the Ice Age, we have to examine something very strange. See, during the late Pleistocene, much of the world's megafauna vanished. Yes, we mean the very giant we've hyped up all throughout the video. For some reason, they all started to face extinction. And at first, we blamed climate change, the usual suspect. But as we looked closer, we discovered something far more unexpected. An image of ourselves and the path our ancestors took. See, according to Paul Martin's overkill hypothesis, when humans entered new territories, large animals disappeared soon after. Now, this sounds absurd at first, but wait until you see the evidence. For example, humans arrived in North America around 14,000 years ago, and within 1,000 years of their arrival, mammoths, mastodons, giant sloths, and saber-toothed cats were all gone. And we can't deny our involvement, because cultures like the Clovers culture were famous for their fluted spear points, which are often tied to mammoth kills. Not to mention, sites like Murray Springs and Lena show clear evidence, such as bones with cut marks, tools, and even burned remains. As of today, mammoth bones are present in 79% of Clovis assemblages, yet only 14 confirmed kill sites exist. Now, some would argue that the number of kill sites are too few to support a full-scale overkill, but as we go around the world, this trend remains. Humans arrive and big animals disappear. Another example of this can be found in Australia, where the story began even earlier. See, humans arrived on the continent about 50,000 years ago, and surprise, surprise, this coincided with the extinction of massive marsupials like the Diprotodon and giant birds like the Genyonis. And if you're wondering why we suspect our ancestors, consider the fact that burnt Genyonis eggshells have been found that date between 53,900 and 43,400 years ago. And as we know, only one species controlled the flames. 
But besides hunting, evidence also points to humans set fires degrading ecosystems, placing additional stress on megafauna already coping with the arid shifts of the time. In New Zealand, the case is even clearer. Polynesians arrived around 1280 AD, and by 1450, all nine moa species were extinct, all of them. Today, over a hundred archaeological sites show moa butchery, cooked eggs, and tools that suggest our involvement. And it's clearer here, because climate change was minimal here, leaving humans the prime cause. Essentially, all evidence pointed to one thing. In a land of giants and monsters, we were the true apex predators. But that leaves a simple question. How? The extinction of megafauna wasn't just a matter of chance. No. In fact, archaeological, ethnographic, and experimental evidence shows us that clearly humans possess the tools, tactics, and teamwork needed to systematically target the giants of the Ice Age. Allow me to explain. When we look at archaeological sites like Schöningen, Germany, we begin to see a picture of how tools helped us kill the impossible. And that's all thanks to the 300,000-year-old wooden spears found there. Although they seem unassuming to us, in the right hands, our ancestors' hands, they were capable of killing large animals. But how? Well, it turns out that these spears, which have been tested through experimental archaeology, could be thrown with force and accuracy up to 20 meters, delivering lethal damage that would bring down even a mammoth. In fact, at Mezirish in Ukraine, at around 13,000 to 18,000 BC, huts were built from hundreds of mammoth bones, suggesting to us that hunting these massive creatures was a regular and organized ordeal. Taking things a step further, landscape analysis at these sites revealed structured layouts and mammoth remains that would be consistent with coordinated kill events, possibly involving drive hunts. For those who don't know, a drive hunt is a way of hunting that involves herding prey into traps, swamps, or cliffs to reduce risk and, well, maximize yield. Moving on from tool use, when we look at the evidence ethnographically, things make even more sense. Take the persistence hunters of the sand people in southern Africa, for example. These people chase prey until it collapses from exhaustion. Now, that might seem wild to you, but the human unique ability to sweat and regulate body temperature is super fascinating, as it enables this exact type of hunting. As it stands, it's likely this endurance strategy worked on Ice Age megafauna, especially in open environments, where groups could track and wear down large animals over long distances. Tired, the animal would put up less of a fight and would be a relatively easy kill. Then, there was fire. As we said before, early humans controlled fire for cooking, but they did a little bit more than that, as they also manipulated their environments using fire. In Australia, for example, Aboriginal fire stick farming from around 48,000 BC transformed the woodlands into grasslands, attracting massive game like kangaroos. Similar practices also occurred in Africa between 98,000 and 48,000 BC. This practice, however, expanded savannas, improving visibility and mobility for hunts. In fact, studies in landscape archaeology that focus on burn scars, soil charcoal, and pollen records confirm that there have been a lot of frequent and deliberate fires that modified habitats and concentrated animals into predictable zones, essentially simplifying hunting logistics. And then there was man's best friend, the dog. Genetic studies placed the domestication of the dog between 20,000 and 40,000 years ago, with our furry friends likely descending from Eurasian wolves. Besides being a companion, these dogs improved hunting success by tracking, cornering, and even harassing prey. And we know this because remains at sites like Predmosti from 25,000 BC show early canine human bonds. But that's not all, as ethnographic records from indigenous North American groups also show dogs were used to hunt large animals like elk and bison, improving efficiency, reducing risk, and guarding campsites. But why go after the giants? Well, energy expenditure models have shown us that there was an economic sense behind hunting megafauna. A mammoth, weighing 4 to 8 tons, for example, provided up to 2 million kilocalories. That's enough to sustain a 25-person band for weeks or months. A deer, on the other hand, offers only 50,000 kcal, meaning you catch a deer and you will soon be hunting again. But you catch a mammoth and the clan can rest for a few days. Even by today's standards, the stakes are a no-brainer. There was also the added fact that while dangerous, drive hunts and endurance tracking spread energy across groups and minimized direct confrontation, which would have led to injuries. 
and seeing as persistence hunting might have burned between 1,000 to 200 kcal per hunter, it seems like a really good deal to go after the bigger prey. Together, archaeological and ethnographic data, along with experimental testing and energy modelling, show us that early humans were not passive scavengers, they were strategic, organised predators. Sure, the debates still continue as very few confirmed kill sites exist, and megafauna in Africa and parts of Eurasia survived longer, suggesting climate shifts also played a role. But the scientific consensus is shifting. Humans didn't just stumble into extinction zones, they engineered them. After all, they had the ability to shape landscapes, wield tools, and cooperate over long durations, which ultimately were the traits that gave them an uncanny, distinct edge. But here's the thing. These three traits are the core of who we are today, and as such, they raise the question, are we any different from our ancestors who hunted giants? So what do you think? Was it our brains, tools, or something deeper within our ancestors that gave us the advantage over the large beasts that roamed the earth? Sure, we adapted, we collaborated and innovated to create a thriving existence in a megafauna world. But was there also something else? Something that set us apart from everything else? Like an unrivaled instinct for survival?